Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Jailhouse Informant. You are locked in for the next hour with myself and my co-host from another location here, uh, <laughs> Dr. Christy Sumner. Hey, Christy. Hey, Miranda. How's it going tonight? It's going great. How about you? It's great. Yeah, I'm down here in Florida right now. Had a very nice evening um, with my family celebrating Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers and grandmothers out there. Thank you so much for what you do. Um, so it's been a great day. I drove down this morning and uh, was having dinner here in Florida by, you know, five o'clock tonight. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, I'm glad you were able to join us. I know, uh, you know, we were kind of unsure with Mother's Day, but I got to tell you, I'm loving this new night. I know. Me too. I, I'm, I'm really, um, I, I think this is going to do a lot for us. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's really great, especially for our schedule. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So, so thank you everyone so much for tuning in tonight. I know we have a really awesome show. Um, you know, got a couple things that we want to kind of talk about before we get started, but, um, but yeah, a great show and, um, you know, really excited to really kick off one of our true crime stories. Mm -hmm. And who do you have in your lap right there? So if you guys have been following this week, you'll see that we actually did a poll. And uh, if you visited the historic Scott County Jail in the last four weeks, you'll probably have seen this uh, lovely lady here that uh, is. There she is. Know. There she is. <laughs> So what we did was we actually, we put a poll out earlier this week and uh, we wanted, we put some names on there and also gave the opportunity for people to enter names if they, if they wanted to, if they didn't like one of our names <laughs> and, uh, and, and vote on it. We had the mm -hmm. poll for right around, I think it was about 32 hours that that poll was up yep. and we had it set up essentially to where we could, um, have her ready for when she went in for her booking the next day. Mm -hmm. So um, we did partner with For Love of Paws, which is here in Scott County, which does amazing things for, um, you know, they they do um, create affordable um, spay and neuter for um, people who, who, who can't afford it with pets. And then they also help to take care of any of the uh, strays and such that are around. So, mm -hmm. so we ended up partnering with for love of paws. And, and, and just, to, I'll just point out that they, um, the veterinary services were, was provided by Young Williams Animal Center in Knoxville. So a big shout out to them and their professionalism for uh, handling our new little girl there. Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, she went over there on Friday. And so she has officially been got up to date on her shots and she's fixed. And so she is officially booked in here at the historic Scott County Jail. And the name that she's been, that's been chosen for her is Sally. Sally. There she I don't know is. You're her purring. Oh, hey, <laughs> Sally. Yeah. So, Sally, and uh, obviously that's a jail term for a cellmate. Um, so as Miranda said, she, she booked herself in and she's there to stay. So we're really pleased with that addition. She's super sweet. So anytime you come to the jail, be prepared to, to meet our new little addition there. Yeah. And get some kitty cuddles. So yes, she, absolutely. She's definitely, definitely a sweet girl. So, mm -hmm. um, so again, lots of really cool things going on here at the jail. We had a really, really busy weekend busy of, weekend. Uh, <laughs> of, paranormal investigations, ghost hunts, flashlight tours. We had a couple of last minute flashlight tours, uh, sold out flashlight tours actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have one tonight as well after this broadcast, got a group uh, that was riding over on Brimstone. They're going to be coming in tonight at 9 PM mm -hmm. and uh, doing a flashlight tour with them. So really excited uh, kicking off uh, May really, really great with those. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, our paranormal research study is just fantastic. Uh, for those who don't know, we are conducting a paranormal uh, research study through the end of this month, essentially, and very quickly, essentially, it's an item in a container that was given to us by a detective. We do not know what the item is. Only person who knows what is in the container is the detective. And so what we're trying to do is get teams that want to come in um, to investigate. They get to investigate this item, right? They get to sit with it, uh, ask questions, do EVP sessions dowsing rods, um, spirit box sessions, whatever you want to do, except for filming it, um, audio or video. Um, and you come in and basically we're trying to get the jail to talk to us, to talk to the teams. And you'll write your answers down. We put them in a lockbox. And on May 31st, we're going to sit down with the detective, open the lockbox and uh, and see if any if anybody got some answers from our jail. Um, and the interesting thing is, 
you know, we've had a couple of questions. Um, we're not going to, you know, this isn't something to prove that you have abilities or anything like that. That's not what we're doing. Um, what we're doing is seeing if the jail will speak to the teams that come in because we've figured, I mean, we've learned some very interesting stories because of the spirits in our jail. Um, and that's kind of what we want to do with the this research study. So it's not an indictment on your gifts or your talents or your um, investigation, investigation skills. That's not what this is about. It's just a fun study to see if if, you know, the spirits of the jail will talk to us. And um, so, you know, we're not going to mention any names. We're not going to mention any teams. And um, so we did have a question about that. So we just wanted to kind of clear it up a little bit. Yeah. And, and th thank you for clarifying that, because, um, you know, it's it's not about a person's ability. Right. You know, it's not about it's it's honestly, truly not about the person who captures the results. This isn't like, you know, if you are a psychic medium and, you know, you don't get the answer to what's in the can. There's a lot of other answers that you can get, you mm -hmm. know. And so, um, you know, so it's it's not a it's not a um, test to see what that is, because, again, it's not about the person. Or it's the team, about yeah. the jail. Exactly. Or about the team. It's about the jail and mm -hmm. it's about um, the research that we've been able, able to get from here. And I'm just so excited by the participation that we've had um, because neither Dr. Sumner nor I know what people are getting as results, mm -hmm. which is what's so fantastic. We don't want to know because we're conducting our own experiments with this as well. I mean, this is an experiment that's been going on since what, uh, the end of January? Mm -hmm. Yeah, end of January. Yeah. And so um, so it goes through May 31st. So there's just a few weeks left. And in fact, we're actually doing something a little different. Somebody that uh, is doing some remote viewing. And so uh, we're, you know, testing that out now just to see if they can get any type of answers from this. Mm -hmm. So so it's really exciting and interesting. And there's a lot of possibilities. So you can still get in on that study. I think we have a couple investigation slots open between now and then. But if you do want to just get on there and investigate for like an hour with the item, if you are remote and can't get here, or if you just want to come in and do that, call a number on the bottom of the screen and we'll set you up with uh, either video chat or, or whatever. You know, we've mm -hmm. got a lot of different ideas. So. Yep. Yep. And then um, this week coming up, we're very excited. We're going to have our first birthday party at the jail. Um, we're going to have a bunch of little eight-year-old boys running around. And uh, the, the birthday boy wanted to have a police-themed birthday. So we're really excited that they chose the jail to do that. And so we'll be keeping everybody up to date next week on how that goes. Um, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So it's something we'll, we're looking forward to. So if you're watching this and you want a unique party, um, the jail is, is a really cool place to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Again, call the number on the bottom of the screen or reach out to us through our website and, uh, you know, just kind of ask for details and and we can customize a party for you that's uh, truly unique. Mm -hmm. so. All right. All right. And so. Wait, one more. Um, don't forget the um, Dart Run Harold Young Memorial Scholarship Dart Run, the second annual that is on May 21st. Please mark your calendars. Come out and join us. You do not have to ride a motorcycle. You can be in a car, a bicycle, walk. If you're in the Huntsville town, just walk to their first stop and just enjoy some of the activities that we're going to be having out there. Um, but it is going to be uh, for a great cause and it's going to be a lot of fun. So yeah, May, 20, May 21st. May 21st at 10 a.m. is when it starts here and it will run until 2. We've uh, already sent an invitation out to this year's winners and hopefully she will be joining us at the third stop and we'll be able to give her a thousand dollar scholarship. Um, she is going into a field of science and so we're hoping to uh, raise more money this year so that we'll be able to even do a bigger scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, exciting. We've already had a couple of uh, people who have sent in donations. So thank you all so much for that. And, um, you know, we've got the address listed if you do want to make a donation to the Harold Young Memorial Scholarship. Uh, and again, that goes to a student that is majoring in the field of sciences. So um, you're going to probably be seeing a lot of that here in the next little bit. Um, we do have, uh, we were going to show a video on that tonight, but I think we'll just go ahead and, and maybe wait um, till uh, either next week or a little bit later on in the week, we'll show the video of what uh, kind of some things that happened last year during mm -hmm. the during the scholarship run. So, because um, I believe it's what two weeks out. Uh, yes, let me check my calendar. Hold on one second. Come on, yes. calendar. Yes. 
Yeah. So yep. it'll be two weeks out. So, so we'll show that video on the show next week. Mm -hmm. But um, I say we go ahead and get to uh, the guest interview if we don't have anything else. Yeah, I'm, I think this is going to be a great interview. Very excited about this. Um, we did pre-record this. So um, we hope everybody just kind of sits back and takes a listen um, as we interview J.H. Gason. Yeah. And so please feel free to go check out his pages. We do have uh, the links where you can purchase his book and also uh, get more information about him. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them here in the chat room, because even though this is a pre-recorded interview, we are live in the chat room answering questions. And um, yeah, just uh, I hope you I hope you enjoy one of the uh, most infamous stories from here at the jail. And actually, before I start this year, before I start this year, I was just going to say we we won't be popping back on because I do have the uh, tour that starts at nine o'clock. Normally, after we show a pre-recorded interview, we do um, come back on and kind of close things out. But because we do have those folks coming at nine o'clock tonight, we will be the broadcast will be ending once the uh, interview ends. Yeah. So anyways, now we can go ahead and start. <laughs> So welcome back, everyone. And we have a very special guest this week. Uh, I know you guys know him, but maybe you don't quite know a face with uh, with uh, this individual. But you've also you've heard us talk about him the last little bit. So we actually have author J.H. Gason with us here today. Hello, how are you all doing? We're great, thanks. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's um, my privilege to be here. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So we're really looking forward to this conversation because um, we know we have a lot of people that come in and want to buy your book. We do have your book here exclusively in um, in our gift shop. So first of all, why don't you tell um, a little bit about who you are and, and how you're associated with the historic Scott County Jail? All right. The notorious part of the interview here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you introduced me there as J.H. Gason. That's my pen name. It's a pseudonym I've been writing under now for many years. Uh, a lot of local people here in uh, Scott County know me as something else, and we'll just leave it at that. Um, depending on who you ask, they may know me as a few things different, but uh, <laughs> J.H. Gason will get me by here. Many years ago, I had a very keen interest in some events that went on here in Huntsville, Tennessee with a local sheriff. Uh, huge, huge FBI investigation and prosecution of public officials. Actually, it stands today as still the largest prosecution of public officials in history, American history. Uh, the last that I checked that it was still the largest prosecution of. Uh, since then, I've gotten to a few other stories, and my new book out now is uh, High Winds, Quest for Rome. Uh, and it's about a story here that's, if you're from Scott County, you know this story. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, most likely you have family or relatives, one or the other, that has been involved with this story. The Cumberland River Cold War is something that every person in this area knows, this region. If you speak about it, the reaction you'll get can be anywhere from a smile to anger, mm -hmm. depending on who you speak with. And uh, it's just a story that defines this area and it defines this jail. And uh, while I'm on that subject, I would like to thank you all personally for doing what you're doing to the jail. The Great Sandstone Castle, as I like to refer to it. When you talk about the local jail in Huntsville, Tennessee, everyone from Scott County knows exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. They immediately have that picture in their mind. It's the most recognizable structure in the area. If people didn't work here. They stayed, they spent the night here for a while sometimes, uh, <laughs> yeah. but it defines this area and it, 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 it's just a staple in this community. And I love to see that something's being done with it other than it just sitting here going to waste. I love that. And I'd like to personally thank you all for that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so you're from Scott County originally, correct? Yes. I went to school, uh, right across the road here <laughs> in the old, uh, uh, uh Huntsville school. Uh, right up the road here in the uh, Scott High School. Um, when I graduated, I joined the military, left and done that, and uh, never really came back. 
I've traveled around. I've done a lot of things. I've been a lot of places. Uh, but I don't feel there's any place that's nearly as beautiful as Scott County, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I've been around a lot. I can say that I've been a few places. Uh, each place holds its own beauty. Don't get me wrong, but this is a very special place right here. Uh, I love the stories associated with Scott County and I love the history mm -hmm. associated with Scott County. I love everything about it. Is, is that why you started writing? Because you wanted some of these stories told or did you just have a an itch to start writing? What what was the catalyst behind your, your start as an author? What, I've always had a love for writing, even when I was a little kid, you know. Um, I got into writing kind of in, it was an interesting story growing up through my teen years, but uh, later on up, uh, I started writing biographies for people and uh, you know, doing that type of work. Uh, uh, it's an open market. It was an open market then, you know, this was back all oh, probably around 20 years ago or so when I really got into it. A lot of life hindered me along the way right there. Uh, but I've always loved writing. I've always loved the story that the pen can tell. Like I said, Scott County is a very wonderful place with a lot of wonderful history. And I wanted to write down that history. I wanted to preserve it, preserve it. Good for you. Uh, because I don't, I, I, we have a lot of uh, historical societies and so forth here. We have this jail, uh, but the people really have to want to preserve their history. Absolutely. Uh, if you don't want to preserve the history, then it's just going to die. Absolutely. So yes, I want to preserve it. Absolutely. And, and it actually ties in really well having you here with us tonight because, you know, last week we had Ranger Daniel Banks here and he talked and gave some amazing history about the Big South Fork. And really what you're going to be talking about with us tonight really ties in very well with the Big South Fork and a lot of events that happened there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, first, let me set the atmosphere. It's 1933. Well, let's start in 1932. In Wilder, Tennessee, uh, the governor had to call out the National Guard because the workers went on strike. Union negotiations fell through. They were wanting safer working conditions. They were led by a named man, Barney Grant. And uh, when all that fell in and they went on strike, the governor at that time, the man I like to call Triple H, uh, had to call in the National Guard, the 109th Cavalry. Uh, they come in to maintain order uh, along the way, they managed to try to freeze out the miners through the winter by removing the doors of their homes. Uh, they shot their cattle. They even shot their pets. They shot their pets standing in the yards on chains. Wow. Uh, they interfered with the Red Cross trying to bring in food. A socialist by the name of Miles Horton. Don't let that word scare you in this story because it's going to happen a few times. Uh, a socialist by the name of Miles Horton uh, came to the aid of the miners. Uh, this group of miners in Wilder, Tennessee, brought food in, uh, brought supplies in, tried to bring medical care in. Uh, he was even arrested at one time and uh, kept on the company yard in the uh, uh, in the observation tower. It was a real rough time. 1933 was the uh, last year, the worst year of the Depression, the last year of Prohibition. FDR had just come in. In March of that year, uh, Hoover went out. Here come the, uh, FDR and brought in with him the New Deal. So, you know, that all this pulls into the environment. It was a hard time. It was a hard time for the people, and it was a different time. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always, when I speak of this story, I always tell people, try not to use our standards and morals of today to judge what happened then, because there's no way we can put ourselves in the position that a lot of these people were facing. This was very difficult times, very difficult times. I mean, it, it, some of the stories that I've read while research, researching this are just tear jerkers. I mean, they literally are. And, and so I really hate to say, try to use the standards that we use today for our morality and, and, and hook that story up with this because it was a different time. It was a different atmosphere. And so when all of that started happening, um, you know, how did that culminate into what, it, what went on down in no business? All right. Uh, it's a Friday night and it's 21st of April. The uh, police got called in the Stearns 
lumber yard. And this is over right there on the Pickett County, Scott County border uh, where the area was at right there where the train was uh, set stall. Mm -hmm. the, the, the popular rumor is that uh, Jerome, Jerome Boyd, as his friends called him, uh, had beat up his uncle Albert, another moonshiner, that there was a conflict over moonshine, something have to do with moonshine. Uh, another underlying cause, another underlying cause to this was Justice Stearns had just passed away in February of that year. So uh, with FDR coming in and bringing in all his new deal legislation and so forth, there was a lot of worry on the part of the mines. Okay, okay they, they, the, the, the miners, uh, from what I understand, the miners at Stearns were still getting paid, but the miners at Wilder were trying to be forced off company property as they brought in scabs. Oh, wow. uh, you know, also the miners of Wilder didn't have any food. So they were going around to neighboring mines and being aided by those miners. Cause you know, a lot of times these were uncles and nephews and cousins, uh, just like the Winningham men that got called from Birdstown, Tennessee, over to the Stearns uh, Lumberyard at night, they had family members in Wilder. Right. They had just come back from Wilder themselves uh, going down there, aiding the 109th Cab uh, with their efforts to, to quell the strike down there. Okay. And uh, so anyway, you've got the Winningham men, they show up and uh, basically, like I said, there's there's some debate on whether or not it was actually over moonshine or whether, but there was an erroneous port report of a murder. Okay. Uh, the police got called. The Winningham men showed up. This would be George and Floyd Winningham. They brought with them a deputy by deputy by the name of Bram Garrett. Uh, there there's also reports that they had the uh, company supervisor and his son with them. Uh, so this makes it around five men, four to five men, you know, depending on how they approach the train there at the Stearns Lumber Yard. Uh, Jerome Boyd's sitting inside. He's got his uh, brother, Eugene Boyd, who's deaf and mute. Uh, there's another gentleman in there with him, Ted Boyd. Uh, don't know if he's any relation. There's a, 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 the, the Walter and Charlie Crabtree, Ly Terry, uh, some reports identify a gentleman by the name of Koger or Kroger. Okay. Uh, he's spelling it. Spelling with this story is one of those things. If you've been reading the newspaper articles, everybody has a different name. Of course. Yeah. So uh, it might be spelled different, but it's the same people. Gotcha. And, uh, but uh, they show up to the train and their intent, I guess, is to arrest Jerome and Apparently, Floyd Winningham, a veteran of the World War I, fires a shot into the train with a uh, shotgun. And Jerome Boyd fires two shots back, killing him instantly. Uh, and he fell dead. George, his father, uh, I'm going, this report of what's happening right here, I'm taking mostly from a, uh, a, a, a interview that was done with a gentleman named Porter Lander in the 70s by the University of Tennessee. Uh, it wasn't someone I spoke with personally. It was at the scene. It was an interview from that. Okay. George made his way around the train back to where his son Floyd was. He started shooting into the train. Uh, but there are written accounts. There's reportings by newspapers and all these different on who shot, fired first, uh, exactly how many shots was fired. But I'm going to say it was a shootout okay. is, is exactly what I'm going to call it because that's what I've called it all along. A shootout because both parties were uh, trying to kill each other. I mean that was that was what happened. And uh, Jerome Boyd just, in my opinion, happened to be the one uh, that made, done the killings that night. Uh, he killed George and uh, uh, his son Floyd right there, and then uh, jumped from the train and disappeared into the woods. Uh, along the way, he set the woods on fire. Uh, a, there are newspaper reports that talk about him calling out catchphrases and so forth uh, as he left the train. I seriously doubt that's true. I'll just be honest with you. I have, from what, from best I can understand, I seriously doubt he hung around long enough to be calling out 
you know, any special catchphrases and so forth. I mean, I know that was during the era of Bonnie and Clyde and everything. <laughs> right. uh, but the fact that he had just gunned down two men and knew he gunned them down, he knew he did because uh, he talked about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I doubt he did. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, it sounds romantic for the newspapers and probably sold up a lot of them at the time. But just my personal idea, I doubt he did. Uh, he was on the run for several weeks uh and uh along the way just a week after that the uh coal company guards in wilder tennessee killed barney graham uh and less than two weeks afterwards uh it was reported to be retaliation for that a direct retaliation because of the murder of george and floyd winningham that's just how it was then. I mean, yeah. you know, we can try to add our, like I said, we can try to add our morality to it now, but it was different times. Absolutely. Uh, it went on for an, another couple of weeks. Uh, I also want to say that during this time, some of the most devastating tornadoes ever to hit Tennessee hit this area. I mean, they hit Burstown, they hit Fentress County, they hit Clinton County, Kentucky, uh, Stearns, Kentucky. It was uh, churches, churches, uh, many churches were destroyed during this time because churches were some of the most prevalent structures. And uh, so many of them were destroyed at the time. Uh, so, you know, now you've got this manhunt going on right in the middle of all these storms, mm -hmm. and that, which adds another element. Because like I said, this was one of the hottest years on record, uh, uh, 1933 was. So as hot as it is now, and the way temper, way people's temper flare now, and it keeps yep. everybody on edge with the heat and the humidity. I can just imagine what it was then, like then. You know, when you're starving to death, mm -hmm. uh, you know the government's against you. Everybody seems to be against you. Uh, I mean, the moonshiners had probably built up collateral with the moonshine business. It's getting ready to disappear in December of that year. Yep. So everybody's a little on edge. I mean. And so there's this massive manhunt. There's a uh, reward for Jerome that's put out by members of, a. Uh, uh, it's been reported everything from the American Legion to the Masons. And I believe uh, it was a little bit of all of them. Uh, you know, the hard, it's hard to say who give the exact amount, but I know a hat was taken up or passed out twice at the funeral. Uh, so I'm sure there was many people uh, donating to this this money to catch this guy mm -hmm. and they were bounty hunters coming from all over the country okay. and coming here to of course to get after rome we're coming up on another important anniversary in the timeline of this events and it's on the 12th which will be ransom boy uh the father of jerome they will find him murdered at his home and no business yeah um uh, it's very speculative on who did it. Uh, I also want to say that 90 years later in researching this and going over to Clinton County and Albany, Kentucky and so forth, uh, I have discovered that they are family members of people who was involved in this, uh, that some of these people did have deathbed uh, declarations that they were involved, mm -hmm. you know, and told afterwards that they were involved. So I put elements of that in my book also. Right. Uh, it, like I said, this is, was a different time. I keep reminding people. I want to say that because I'm talking about people's families here. Of course, of you course. know, in this area, I'm, I, these are real people. This is people, uh, you know, you can go right down the road and find grandkids mm -hmm, of absolutely. people that was involved in this. And yep. so I, I try to be real careful of what I say. I, I don't want to offend anybody because I have the highest respect for everybody involved here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ransom boy was murdered. I mean, it just, it, it, it's, it's that it's simple. Fact, he yeah. was murdered mm -hmm. uh, and no one was ever brought to justice for that. We can speculate on who done it, uh, but thing is we will never know. Mm -hmm. We will probably never know. And it, his body was discovered on the 14th. Uh, they've got him listed as the 12th on the death certificate because there was an inquiry into his death which they did say was murder. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, Jerome gave himself up. Yep. Uh, where he was came here and was lodged here mm -hmm. and uh, lodged on the third floor 
1933, just one month short of any decisions being made concerning the unions of uh, uh, the strike in Wilder and, mm -hmm. and, and subsequent. Let me also say about the, the company, coal companies at that time, there was several coal companies right here in one spot. So many different companies in Fentress County. Uh, mm -hmm. If you go up to uh, Stearns, you had Stearns, you had Oz, Co-op, Bar the Barthel Coal Mine, White Oak. Some of these mines traded owners over card games. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, to try to keep up with everybody that owned a mine at that time, well, it was kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. So, Jerome come here to the jail, and this is where they come got him. Yeah. This is where they got him out. This is where they uh, took him off the third floor here and uh, took him right down the road here to around uh, what I – what I've always known as around the entrance to Rowan State Community College right now. Mm -hmm. If a, a lot of, uh, uh, that's why I said earlier, forget the boundaries. Right. Because, you know, it, it, a lot of things you read will say that he was killed. They were, him and Harvey Winchester both were taken at the same time. That they were killed just outside of Huntsville city limits. Well, that now stands way past where uh, the college is now. Mm -hmm. So where I've always heard it was, was somewhere, somewhere around Rome State Community College. That's where I was shown it was at many years ago because some of these people were still alive back in the 80s. That, and uh, right up to recently, quite, some of them were still alive that was involved in this, knew of this, the outcome of this, and mm -hmm. so forth. And some things I try to watch, what I'm saying is not to give away the, the, the storyline of my book. Of course. Yes. And because, of course, I want y'all to come in and buy the book. It's on the shelf here. And uh, <laughs> got to throw that plug in there. There you, know? you go. That's right. And uh, so, I mean, it, it's one of the most notorious stories mm -hmm. ever to take place here in this county. And, and just to be honest about it, I think still one of the more heroic stories that's yet to be told is the one that took place right here in this doorway. Yep. Uh, between the jailer and the people who come in to get they get Harvey and Jerome that night. Mm -hmm. That story in itself holds more heroics than any of the rest of the story put together. Uh, I didn't include a whole lot of it in the current book, High Winds, because I wanted to tell it separately. Uh, and there's also an element to that book, and I, I, I want to let you all start that out because I'm still kind of had goosebumps about this a little bit. So I'm, I'm going to let you all start that one out a little bit. To say this first, you had mentioned about, you know, it being here on the shelf and we can't hardly keep it on the shelf. We've gone through, I think, what, about three orders now with you. I mean, people people loved your, your first book that you talked about earlier in the show and then they, they love this one. We've gotten a lot of reports from people who have come in, they bought it and they're like, I read it in two days, yeah. you know? And so, um, so just got to say, you know, best selling, you know, <laughs> it is sold out, you know, here a lot. We do have some currently here uh, that you can get in the jail and then also um, online. But, um, but yeah, just, just fascinating. The mm -hmm. things, the, the history that we're actually finding out from our paranormal investigators here, here at the jail. And, um, you know, just to kind of tease on that just a little bit, we did, uh, we did receive an early copy of, of the book. And so, um, Christy and I were kind of thumbing through it. And, uh, one of the details that stood out when we did that is Anvil Clemens. And so uh, we kind of remarked on that and then, um, you know, put the book away. And uh, later that evening when a paranormal investigation team came, they did their investigation. And we always tell them when they come in, we're like, you know, anything that you get that might seem insignificant or strange, you know, just come to us, let us know, and we'll do some research to see if we can validate that through history. And so the particular team that was here that night, they were from out of the London, Kentucky area. And uh, one of them came to me just before they were getting ready to leave. And he said, you know, we got all of this different stuff. But one of the main things that stands out to me is we kept getting the word anvil and we kept getting it right in the front of the building. And so I said, you know, it's really funny you mentioned that. And I said, uh, and so I went, I grabbed the advanced copy of the book, which no one had seen except for us. And uh, I said, it's interesting that this character in the book's name is Anvil. And I said, let me reach out to the author and, and see what he can tell us about it. And so when I reached out to you, I was really blown away by your response. If you want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, certainly, certainly. And uh, it, I, I hope my hair doesn't stand on this end. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I've been worried about that all the way down here. Yeah. <laughs> My novels have a, what I like to refer to as a copyright character. A copyright character is a character that you add to a novel uh, or in any piece of literature you can add to. And the purpose of that character is to be loosely based uh, on people that's involved with the story as so enough to keep it a true story, mm -hmm. but yet have a unique name and have a unique persona and a, a character to them, a unique character. And what that's for is so if anybody tries to copy my story, I know without doing the research on it, I know. I mean, you'll see it all the time in newspapers and so forth. Uh, the newspaper will come out and they'll tell a story about something and then they'll have the character's name there as involved in it. And it was a character that I come up with. And one of the characters that I come up with was uh, Anvil Clemens. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Anvil Clemens is based on an actual person that was involved with the Cumberland River Cold War. Uh, a lot of the names, well, not a lot of them, but a few of them I did change just out of respect for the family and people involved. Because, like I said, this is really dealing with people right around here. People's grandkids and stuff will be reading this. So, you know, I have a copyright character in there and really nobody knows who they are. Right. And but I'm coming out with it here and explaining this just because I want to tell this little detail here. Um, my grandfather, adopted grandfather, was the jailer at the time. Uh, Jerome and Harvey was taken, and uh, actually, to be honest about it, uh, my great great grandfather was also the big brother of the sheriff that was killed here. Uh, oh, wow. And I'm also a cousin to the sheriff that was not in this jail because it's for then, but uh, Callaway. Uh, so I have kind of a history uh, with the events that go on uh, of the Cumberland River Cold War and stuff. And so I kind of also grew up with this story uh, here in, uh, you know, of what, what transpired here because it was inevitably his kids that had to take care of him because the night they come in and got Jerome and Harvey, they beat the jailer about to death. I mean, they left bloodstains on the wall. They about beat him to death. I mean, it was a severe beating. Uh, it, once again, there's a lot of speculation on the events of that night of what transpired actually here at the jail. Uh, everything from the sheriff was in on it to the jailer was in on it to everybody was in on it to nobody was in on it. They just walked out and, you know, done that to theirself, I guess. I don't know. Uh, so we're just going on speculation of what happened, but, uh, I know that the people that I met, that I grew up with that was involved personally with this jail, one of the things that they always said about that night was the jailer getting beat was they beat him like an animal. And I guess that was a, the, a saying back then, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. you think about it, it's 1930s, uh, Horse and buggy, I'm sure, was still a very prevalent means of transportation. And I'm sure there was uh, phrases like that that went around. Yep. But that phrase struck, stuck with me just because of the fact that it was two relatives that told me about that. Uh, that I believe we're here. I believe they were here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the family didn't say a whole lot about the events that went on here because it was a hard time. I mean, they literally come in here, took two men out of a jail. Imagine waking up in the morning and finding out that a posse went into the Scott County Detention Center here and drug out two people and murdered them. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it'd be, it'd be shock. Right, it yeah. would be shock. I mean, I dumbfounded and, and I'm sure it was no different then. And, you know, these people had to live in fear because this is, wasn't something that just ended that night. Uh, mm -hmm. The Cumberland River Cold War actually lasted for months and years afterwards. It was like the Civil War. It was mm -hmm. hard to end. Yeah. And, uh, but the fact that you're all part of the paranormal team come up with that because that was something no one could have ever known. Mm -hmm. I've, I've never told anyone that story. And the only reason that it even stuck with me was the, just the, just the looks on the faces of the people that used that phrase to me. Yeah. Well, you know, this was their father they was talking about. And I mean, so 
you know, they had to nurse him back to health. This man laid in the hospital bed for weeks afterwards. Uh, that's why I never thought that he was involved in it. I never thought the Scott County police was involved in it. Still to this day, I don't believe that. There's nothing to me that indicates that. Everything that indicates to me on who was involved in it's in the book. So you'll have mm-hmm. to buy that. To, <laughs> but it, it, yeah. uh, it was just that little paranormal element there. When you all come back with that, that, that kind of really threw me off. Because like I said, that was something, even when people asked me about that character, people close to me, I tell them now, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a copyright character. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it's like an error mark that you put in something just to, that you can make sure that it's yours. Right. You know, nobody can steal that. I mean, if they go out there and they reprint the same error, guess what? They're pl- they plagiarized your work. Exactly. He was named after that phrase because of what they said that night when they come in and got him out of the jail. And uh, I'm, it's had my hair standing on ends ever <laughs> since, I'm telling you. And so you can about imagine. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting goosebumps a little bit just sitting here talking about well, it. Well, and that's what so, was so incredible to us about that whenever we talk to you because, I mean, yeah, people can, if, if you do research the historic Scott County Jail, for the most part, that, that's one of the stories you're going to find. You're going to find about Jerome Boyett and Harvey Winchester and R.D. Ellis and, and some of the, the bigger named uh, events that happened here, but you're not going to find Anvil. Right. And the fact that they got it in a location that was in the area and also a, a character, there is no way that they could have pre-researched that to say, well, you know, I'm going to kind of stick that in there. There's absolutely no way. So that's one of those things that was just, to me, so fascinating. And I know when I told Christy what you told me, it's like, you're not going to believe this. Uh And we were just, we were elated by just how, again, that's what this jail does. This jail gives little tidbits of information and being able to validate through that through the history or through talking to you know you and, and your book and that sort of thing it it, it my mind is blown mm-hmm. honestly it, it, it blew me away I, i'll be honest with you when you first mentioned it to me i was kind of like well i didn't really know what to think about it you know because i it, it, it's kind of drawn me into the whole paranormal aspect of this a lot more than I really was. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'll just be honest with you. I, I, the paranormals of it was something that I never really kind of dwelled into. You know, I was always, when I done my study and research on the jail, it was on the events that took place here later with uh, uh, the Mach 10 investigation, or it was the events that took your, took place here with Jerome and everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when you all come back and mention that, I was, it, it's, it, it literally gives me goosebumps right now. It gives yeah. me goosebumps right now because there's an, almost like it was meant for me to know or something. Yeah. yeah. And so, it, it, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's something I don't know how to re- react to it. That's why I said, I'll let you all start that one <laughs> off because that has been uh, one, one of the, like wow factors mm-hmm. of everything that I've been doing here. This that's probably one of the biggest wow factors that I've had. I had me uh <laughs> and the timing I don't know. the timing was perfect because you know I mean you came, you did a book signing here and, and met with a lot of folks and we kind of did a rollout release. And this was what maybe like a month or so before it was, the book was even released. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, we had yes. one in uh, each copy. Hey, well, you, actually, the book it had been written for years. I just never uh, published the book. I had already yeah. written the book, and I had even, you know, to be honest about it, it wasn't even really a big thing in my mind until you mentioned it. And I was like, I oh, now wait a minute. Hey. You know, how would they have known that? And and to be honest about it, I kind of sat down and went through the book again to make sure I hadn't said nothing to indicate to anybody that that's what had taken place. And, um, you know, to to give a little spoiler away in the book, if you'll notice, Anvil is not present when when all of this takes place, when all of this transpires. He's present at the jail earlier, but he's not present when all. So the fact that it was, there's no way anybody could have just read the book and put that together. Exactly. It it was, it was, had to be something, something. And, and and I hate to, I hate to speculate. I don't know because the paranormals of it is something that I've not really got into. And I just hate to speculate on it, but I know that right there is 
it, well, it's left me speechless. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. I mean, usually I have plenty to say and nothing worth hearing, but I mean, you know, this has just left me absolutely speechless. So it's just such a wild story. Mm -hmm. Um, just with everything that you have in this book, um, it's like I said, I totally understand why people really enjoy it. I, I get asked all the time. Is it a true story? And it is absolutely a true story. It, it makes me smile every time I tell people that because it, you asked anybody here, you know, like I said, if you asked anybody that's from Scott County around the region about the Cumberland River Cold War, somebody will have a family member that was involved in it. Yeah. Somebody can tell you something intimate about this story. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the story High Winds itself, the book, I believe it captures the character of the people then. I believe it's uh, got well-rounded characters. Hope that I've captured the correct atmosphere of the mm -hmm. time. Uh, you know, it being 90 years from, removed from the event, I mean, I, that's all I can do is hope that I did. Uh, but it, it, from everything, from all the feedback that I've got from people that was involved with it, I would I also like to say that one of the gentlemen, actually the gentleman that called, uh, went and called the police, uh, George and went Floyd Winningham to the scene that night was a gentleman by the name of Trigger Waters. His son, uh, who is 93 years old now was alive during this. And well, I mean, he would have been three years old during this, yeah. but, uh, you know, he has also commented on my book and he said it is one of the closest representations that, uh, he knows of. And, and well, to be honest about this, the only novel that I know of regarding, uh, that was another reason why I, I wanted to write a book concerning this subject. Uh, there was, wasn't really any novels on the subject. There were information bulletins. And, and, and short stories and so forth out there. But I wanted something that people could really sit down and read mm -hmm. and get a good understanding of what was going on with the Cumberland River Cold War. Because something that's also a very interesting about this story, the gentleman that I mentioned earlier, Miles Horton, that came in and uh, was dating Barney Graham during all this. Well, he went on to open up the Highlander School. Well, I'm sorry, he had already opened the Highlander School and the Wilder campaign was the catalyst was 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 their his first endeavor in any uh civil rights in any trying any of that so forth because he was a socialist and uh but he went on to uh be a very influential person to martin luther king rosa parks uh kate stockton which was the uh, uh, socialist candidate for governor in 1934. Mm -hmm. And uh, really he's considered the shadow father of the civil rights movement. So the civil rights movement actually began right here in Fentress County, Tennessee, right down the road here. Uh, it, it began with this story and, and there's a lot of aspects to that. I mm -hmm. mean, that raises a lot of questions. Uh, and it also is a good indication of why a lot of people want the story to get, be kept quiet because these were socialists. But the fact <laughs> of the matter is it was something that was very influential. It was a, a political platform that was very influential here. Uh, and it played a part in it. Uh, yeah, I absolutely believe that the, uh, the also at the time that the, uh, we had the governors changed hands from uh, Triple H to McAllister, these were two different governors. You know, they, the governor changed there in uh, uh, January, I believe it was, of 33. They dealt with the unions differently. They dealt with the people differently. Right. Uh, one governor sent the 109th Cav in, one pulled them out. Right. Uh, over the course of the year, while the strike was going on, uh, the National Guard was called in and out several times. Some people say they occupied the entirety of the time. Mm -hmm. Some people say that they left and came back. So where did they go? I mean, uh, a lot of aspects to this story, but Absolutely. when people ask, I say the civil rights movement started right here in Wilder, Tennessee with the Cumberland River Cold War. Mm -hmm. right. uh, one of the unique things about it was, uh, uh, I can't verify exactly how many or which exactly coal camp it was or so forth, but they did employ uh, African Americans and white people worked together. Mm -hmm. That was illegal. Uh, believe it or not, that was legal at the time. We were still under Jim Crow laws of the South. Uh, and oddly enough, the only people that it seemed to be illegal to 
was the outside world. I don't see that anybody local here in Fentress County and Scott County had any problems with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that it was widespread or well accepted or that, you know, there wasn't some fallout from it and everything. I'm just saying that there absolutely was some African Americans here. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things that I touch on in my book. Like I said earlier, a lot of the newspaper bulletins have misspellings in the last names. Yeah. And uh, somebody pointed out to me recently a few that some of the last names of the people involved could have been people that came into work. Uh, okay. I don't know that that's true. I don't know that, that I can't verify that. That's actually just something that I read one time and, and don't know, but I wanted to touch on it because I didn't want to exclude anybody. I didn't, I didn't, I wanted to, the story to stay intact. Of course. And, 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 and to be honest, that aspect didn't really play a big role in it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was more or less the socialism. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe the governor did send the guard in to annihilate the people that was here simply because they were socialists. Uh, it played a big part in Kentucky politics. Uh, Kentucky actually made bounty hunting illegal because of this event, mm -hmm. fallout from this particular event. It took, I think, another... To 1976 to get it ratified or something but it was fallout from where there were so many uh people showing up to collect a reward on this mm -hmm. uh that kentucky had fallout from that they had a shootout at their sheriff's department I, I never could verify that i mean that was always rumored and uh, was put in print but it was in print that i never could verify them. so I, I it was just something that i i'll put out there and don't know if it was true that it actually happened or not uh good possibility because everything sounds right it, it mm -hmm. sounds right somebody uh mentioned to me that i was the foremost scholar on this subject so i don't know who the other three people they're talking <laughs> about are. but uh <laughs> from everything that i've studied it's a good possibility yeah um and and i don't know but i believe i know that socialism was a big thing then and uh they wanted it out of here and i believe that paid played a bigger part then I'm actually being moonshiner just fighting up on the hill. I believe it was a, a, a potential of a blow up of a strike mm -hmm. in the Stearns coal camp. And that was the reason why the George and Floyd got called. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I'm sure I, I'm sure moonshine played a part in it somewhere. It always does. I mean, I come on. It's a Scott <laughs> County. You know? <laughs> I, I mean, you, I probably play a part in a little bit of everything, even the people that don't drink. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I believe it had a little bit to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I believe the bigger aspect was the company wanting to quell down any potential violence or any potential rare ups mm -hmm. uh, of the miners. Yeah. And I believe that was because, you know, the Windhams were known to carry the big stick of the company, gotcha. as I like to put it. And the coal companies at that time run everything. Yeah. I mean, they built the schools, they built the libraries, they built the churches. Yep. Uh, the town script was based on what they said. You know something, another thing interesting about this story, they put a $600 bounty on Jerome's head. And there was people coming from overseas uh, searching for this bounty, uh, to collect this bounty. It, well, you, you with that inflation and everything, if you add that up in the day's currency, they say that's only around $13,000. You couldn't get somebody off the couch to chase anybody for $13,000. You couldn't get somebody for $13,000 to chase a dog. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I, that shows how the atmosphere was a different times and Absolutely. different place. I mean, you know, people come out and $600 was a lot of money. That could mm -hmm. change somebody's mm -hmm. life back then. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, it's a fascinating story. It is. Another fascinating story that goes along with it is after uh, Jerome and Harvey was taken out of here, the brother and son of Floyd Winningham, the son of George Winningham, was also shot and killed in uh, Clinton County, Kentucky, just a month or so afterwards in July uh, by a man named Reed Cox. Uh, and, you know, that in itself is a... a, a has another element that plays in on this. You know, you had an entire family of law enforcement officials that was killed right there within, you know, two months, three months of each other. 
And I mean, this was a lot of wives lost husbands, you know, uh, mothers lost sons. I mean, kids lost their parents. Uh, and, and, and the tragedy and the events of back then, it, it, let's just say I had a lot of sleepless nights. <laughs> let's just say I had a lot of sleepless nights reading the events and uh, studying on the characters and, you know, the people involved in this. Mm -hmm. How long did it typically take you to research uh, for this book? Oh, I spent years actually researching okay. for it. I had been, uh, I had received uh, letters, personal correspondence from the uh, Boyd family. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, uh, me, there's people brought many, many artifacts, newspaper oh, sure. clippings, stories. I've sat down with many, many people on this subject. Uh, too many to enumerate right now at this point and talk about all of them, you know, uh, cause once again, like I said, if you're from around here, you're involved in this story. Yeah. And so I tried to catch a little bit of all of it from mm -hmm. every, put a little bit of all of it from everybody in the book. I wanted to touch on, uh, but a little something from everybody that way everybody felt included, but I didn't want to disrespect the characters either because like I said, this is real events with real people mm -hmm, absolutely. and it, but it is a big part of our history. These were elected officials. Um, I mean, this event took place here, right here at this jail. It was public then it's public now. It's just, it's a very tragic event, but it's one of those stories that defines that area and it defines this area. The moonshine the air. Yes, so, and it defines this jail. Yes, yeah, absolutely. oh, absolutely. Everybody has an opinion on it when they come in this door. Yes, they do. Yes, so, they do. I've caught a few opinions on it. And stuff, <laughs> so, I mean, so that's why, know. yeah, that's why we're really excited to have this book in our gift shop. Um, you know, just just the amount of research that you put into it, uh, the fact that it's a, it's a story that's very relevant to what we're trying to do here. Um, you know, we just can't thank you enough for allowing us the opportunity to to sell that and represent the book. Oh, I want to thank you all. I want to thank you for this opportunity to talk about the book. I want to thank you uh, for the jail here, what you all have done. Like I said, when you mentioned the great sandstone castle, this is something I hope stands forever. I hope this place stands another hundred years. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something our kids can hang their hat on. So I really thank you all for what you've done here at the jail, what you're doing in the community. Uh, the the bike run that's coming up the uh harold young bike event uh i i don't have enough good words for it i yeah, yeah i'm a rider and my good words i run out of them just talking <laughs> about it so well, uh, congratulations on everything that you've done and keep going mm -hmm. keep doing it well, well thank you and so you actually have a couple books out right the the um the high winds is actually sold here in paperback yes the high winds is sold here uh i also have uh the high winds final chapter which is sold ebook it's mm -hmm. online it's a uh fictitious telling of william winningham after this event okay uh but it goes along very well with some of the events that because he has a very unique story in his life too. After this, even though his life only goes on a month or so, but I don't want to get carried away on that because I don't want to give away all that book. Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, yes, uh, but at the moment, those are the only two books that I have out. I do uh, sometime this summer plan on uh, publishing another book. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be about Calvin Logston, which was a gentleman back in the 1800s uh whose trial was held here in uh scott county his first murder trial here just to give a little bit of that story away he was hanged in 1872 in jamestown tennessee mm -hmm. on april 5th and it's uh, a fascinating story very you fascinating. guys are going to absolutely yes. love this book it is i mean we know the story and it's unreal um what happens in this book and then um so yeah so the other books you can buy on ebook um but again you can have the uh, you can high winds are sold right here yeah, at the jail and paperback exclusively from this jail and i want to i want to thank you all for that as well because mm -hmm. that gives, that is to me one of the greatest honors that book being sold here well you're absolutely welcome and you know thank you for joining us today it's just it's always a pleasure to speak with you about this thank absolutely. you thank you